OK. Uh, th thanks for everyone. Mer merci uh, à vous tous d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui. I, I want to begin by uh, recognizing that the we are gathering today on the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Uh, I'm here to discuss our long anticipated report, an immigration system for Canada's future, based on what we have heard from stake stakeholders, Canadians, newcomers uh, during our strategic immigration review that's been occurring throughout the year. Immigration is the defining characteristic of our country, and with the exception of Indigenous peoples, we have been here since, who have been here since time immemorial, uh, all families trace their path to Canada through immigration, some more recently than others. We are a welcoming com country where newcomers can feel like they're part of the community and we can, and where we can understand that immigration helps our economy grow, um, increases our diversity and builds the communities that we live in. We continue to have significant demand for newcomers, especially workers who are bringing skills we need like healthcare, trades to build new homes and tech workers to support our innovation economy. We're also mindful that many Canadians and newcomers are, are really struggling to find reasonable housing and face rising costs. Immigration can and, and must be part of the solution. We want an economy that continues to grow, to remain a welcoming country for newcomers to thrive while meeting the needs of communities across Canada. Pour continuer d'attirer les nouveaux arrivants et demeurer un chef de file mondial en matière d'immigration, nous savons que notre système doit continuer à s'améliorer. Notre modernisation actuelle vise à bâtir un système plus efficace, plus efficient et plus équitable. Mais avec une vision à long terme, nous voulions comprendre ce dont nous aurions besoin pour l'avenir. That's why we held extensive, and the previous minister, Sean Fraser, held extensive consultations across the country and online this year. In addition to getting input from every region of the country, we held in-depth sessions with experts on key issues like housing, rural immigration and skills attraction. Nous avons recueilli les commentaires de Canadiens de tout le pays, de nouveaux arrivants qui ont utilisé nos services par le biais notamment d'une enquête en ligne. From provinces to territories and employers, we heard about the continued need for skilled workers. Nearly 100% of our recent labor growth has been driven by immigration. We need workers to help address challenges like building homes and supporting health cares. With an aging population, people living longer, families having fewer children, Canada imperatively needs immigration to rebalance our dem demographics and support the growing need for workers. We looked at the challenges in today's system and how it can be improved. We heard about the challenges of finding affordable housing and hiring workers to support growing companies and regional priorities. We also heard about challenges that newcomers face, like complexity of navigating different immigration options, unpredictable housing timelines that can delay family reunification, and impact recruitment efforts. Tomorrow, our government will table its annual immigration levels plan that aims to meet the balance and the needs of these communities, employers, provinces, territories, and municipalities. And just as we announced our plan for new digital services and improved processing a few years ago, Today we're laying out our plans to build an immigration system that can meet the future demands of our country. Les idées judicieuses et les commentaires positifs ont confirmé que les Canadiens à l'échelle du pays comprennent l'importance de l'immigration pour notre avenir économique et nos engagements humanitaires. Through the survey that we held, we had significant feedback from over 16,500 voices with their thoughts and ideas. En plus de solliciter les contributions de toutes les régions du pays, nous avons organisé des sessions approfondie de consultation avec des experts sur des questions clés telles que le logement, l'immigration rurale, l'attraction des compétences. Un bon nombre de ces séances ont été dirigées par des ministres eux-mêmes, des secrétaires parlementaires et des sous-ministres. We've heard from Indigenous representatives, business leaders, rural and remote communities, youth councils, provincial and territorial governments, education institutions, and groups who provide services to newcomers. Frankly, services that we as a government can't provide. We are encouraged to boost collaboration to position a system that's responsive to the needs of all those linked to it based on improved information sharing and planning. Since engagement began in February, we've already made some improvements to help address what we've heard. Uh, and I announced last week reforms to our international student program to improve the integrity of the program principally and prevent fraudulent submissions. 
We've refined recently our express entry system to be more targeted and provide invitations to candidates with skills in shortage areas, what we called category-based selection. This is answering a key demand of stakeholders to actually match the supply with the demand. IRCC also launched the tech talent strategy this year, including a stream for H-1B visa holders in the U.S. That program reached capacity in under 48 hours. I myself am a beneficiary of an H-1B just on the other end, so I know that it actually marginally helped my education and integration into the workforce. Our new digital systems, uh, the hard work of our teams and increased processing capacity are reducing backlogs and bringing programs to our standard service times for new application. And I would draw your attention to the recent Auditor General's report that points to that progress and the progress that's been achieved since then. We're also making it easier for applicants to find information they need and make our website more user-friendly. It's been a challenge. For example, we have a new improved client experience platform to provide a better online experience and simpler access for those seeking to use our programs to visit, immigrate, work, study in Canada, become a Canadian, and get a passport, all with the effort in bringing this system into the 21st century, finally. Based on what we heard in our consultations, we've developed a path forward with essentially three main themes. First, improving the welcoming experience for newcomers. We'll work towards a system of service excellence that is more human-centric and understands the significance and life-changing decisions that newcomers are making when they come to Canada. We'll work to make the system easier to navigate and help users make informed selections with predictable and clear decisions within the service standards. So we've identified to that end um, a few early steps, create a council of newcomers with a new advisory board with lived experience to guide the policy of the client experience continue modernization to provide user-friendly digital systems like online accounts, support smaller communities to attract and retain newcomers, providing the right services around the country, and frankly, review our service standards so that our processing times take into the conditions that people are actually facing, because at the end of the day, we're always dealing with humans. Um, our aim to improve services won't only stop with newcomers. We're also addressing border crossings for Indigenous peoples in Canada, since traditional territories can cross the U.S. border or more appropriately, a border that has crossed those territories and peoples. Second, we need to better align immigration programs, systems and services with Canada's labour market. This is what we've heard consistently from uh, stakeholders and all those um, will it, that sh speak to us on a daily basis about their needs, uh, for example, in the construction industry, um, for in, in the healthcare industry, making sure that we are aligning properly that supply to the demand. By aligning our systems with the needs of workers, we'll give and continue to give ourselves a competitive advantage by linking sectoral, regional, and industrial strategies to our immigration plan. We can help drive growth in priority areas. All this work won't be done overnight, but the work is underway, and this was an important uh, element that was brought to us as part of the consultation that began in February. Pour prendre des mesures immédiates, nous avons trouvé de nouvelles idées, un poste de dirigeant principal de recrutement de talent étrangers pour déterminer les besoins futurs des travailleurs et définir une stratégie d'attraction plutôt à long terme pour le recrutement de talents. Lead global skills missions and partnerships with government representatives will be a key task. Uh, align our international student admissions and postgraduate work permit program to current and future needs of Canadians. This uh, is an open element that I announced on Friday, um, which will be work that will be continued as we hear the needs to align those talents with the skills needed in the labour market. And the third theme that I mentioned focuses on developing a comprehensive and coordinated growth plan, one that brings governments and partners together to ensure that we have the services and supports that newcomers need to succeed. This means housing, health care, infrastructure, among other success factors. I will not underestimate the importance of that. If we've heard anything from Canadians over the past few months, from the extensive surveys that are being done, um, Canadians aren't close to immigration, but they want people like me, they want provinces, they want cities to do a better job in coordinating uh, the arrival of immigrants, even temporary workers, uh, and that's something that is a challenge for all levels of government. Um, it's also why we, and particularly in the context of a housing crunch that has very little to do with immigration and has been 30 to 40 years in the making, will continue to prioritize trades and skilled workers in construction. Um, I'm looking at a number of options within my department to make that stream more attractive to, to foreign workers, uh, including credentials, having support from unions and employers to make sure that those construction jobs that are needed, we predict about 100,000 over the course um, 
of the time we need to build all the houses we need for Canadians. That will not all come domestically, it'll have to come from abroad. Similarly, we've heard uh, and we've made medical staff uh, and nurses an immigration priority and offered newcomers priority entry because of their education and experience in healthcare. The comprehensive planning will also take into account the growing numbers of displaced persons globally um, in response to asylum demands and humanitarian responses. Um, again, the issue here is coordination and meeting the needs of Canadians that have asked Canada and their governments to have open hearts, uh, but also to plan better to the immigration and movement of people that we are seeing in mass numbers uh, and in unprecedented numbers across the planet. And that is not going to end anytime soon, despite our geographically favorable position as a country in Canada. Um, I also want to spend some time and I'll have some opportunity over the next couple of days to talk about Francophone immigration policy. Uh, we have made this a staple of our government and clearly we have heard from stakeholders that we need to do a better job in increasing our level of ambitions. Um, I plan to be ambitious with the targets that I'll be announcing in the next few days, but I also want to be realistic. There's nothing more disappointing than having a politician stand up, make an announcement and not have the promise fulfilled a year later. So my focus on that is making sure that my department is actually putting the mechanisms and the logistics together to make sure that Francophone communities outside Quebec are actually getting the people that they need and so desperately need to maintain the social balance and the bilingual nature of our country, as well as inside Quebec and working with Quebec and the needs that they have, uh, whether they need more Francophone uh, teachers or the migration that uh, Quebec needs um, for its own purposes that we will uh, respect as part of the Canada-Quebec Accord that has been around for about 30 years. Um, finally, I, I want to say that I remain convinced advancing Canada's humanitarian lead leadership on the world stage. We are the envy of many countries in the way we have um, welcomed people, uh, but this is something that Canadians are asking us to do in much more of a planned way. Um, but it is important to maintain that beacon of light across the world because lots of countries are looking to us in our continued leadership and it's something that we need to keep going, um, particularly as we face, as I mentioned earlier, unprecedented mass migration due to war, famine, starvation, um, climate change. So I want to thank you all for being here today. This is uh, the work that has been done by my team as we took a look over the summer at a strategic plan that uh, had a lot of work done to it. It was largely accomplished by the hard work of my predecessor and the civil service that, that supports him and supported him and continue to support me now. But this is work that Canadians have put a lot of effort into with some of the stakeholders that you may be speaking to uh, fed directly into it and will see themselves in the report that you will have the opportunity to review. But it is also uh, something that has been a long time coming, um, particularly as we look to modernize something that um, has not been particularly responsive to Canadians' needs over the last few years. So I thank you. Impatient de prendre vos questions et um, commentaires. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We will now take questions from the media. One question, one follow up. Please state your name and the outlet you represent. We will start with those joining us in person, then move over to jo those joining us over the phone. Nous allons maintenant prendre des questions de la part des journalistes. Une question, une question de suivi chacun. Veuillez mentionner votre nom uh, et le journal que vous représentez. Nous allons commencer par ceux qui sont présents dans la salle. Bonjour, M. Miller. Vous avez dit ce matin, uh, vous avez dit, il n'y a pas de scénario où on baisse les cibles d'immigration. Est-ce qu'il y a un scénario dans votre esprit où on les garde tels quels après 2025, où on les stabilise, ces cibles-là? Je pense que le mot d'ordre, c'est euh, l'idée d'une certaine stabilisation. Je ne suis pas aveugle au, euh, à ce qu'on a vu, la recherche qui a été effectuée durant la dernière année, le consensus social qui, euh, qui s'est tissé durant les dernières années, et surtout la, la rétroaction que reflète le rapport aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire le consensus social que les gens euh, ont besoin de l'immigration. C'est clair, quand, quand, je, quand je suis né, c'était sept ouvriers pour un retraité. Là, c'est plus rendu dans, dans, dans les deux à trois. Euh, donc, c'est grave, notre problème. C'est un, euh, un programme démographique de taille. Euh, le défi auquel je fais face en est moins un qui est de nature électorale qu'un qui est plus générationnel. Um, mais ça, c'est un débat de société, hein? ce n'est pas un débat nécessairement entre, entre les politiciens. Uh, donc, étant donné tout ce que j'ai vu uh, durant la dernière année, surtout durant les derniers trois mois au sein de ce ministère, les demandes des 
des, 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 de, de l'industrie, des employeurs, des, des syndicats. On a besoin de gens, puis ils ne viennent pas d'ici. Euh, la question pour nous, c'est de quelle façon le gouvernement fédéral exerce-t-il son rôle, surtout avec la forte influence des provinces, euh, le Québec qui a son propre accord. Et, et, et le constat que je fais, c'est que c'est difficile de diminuer de façon significative euh, ces visées. À, à l'intérieur des trois piliers qu'on a, c'est-à-dire le pilier humanitaire et les deux autres piliers largement économiques, réunification familiale et le volet économique, qui, eux, reflètent euh, l'augmentation nette du PIB de notre pays. Euh, dans les sondages, on voit, c'est un aparté, mais dans les sondages on, où on pose des questions sur l'immigration aux citoyens canadiens, on pose rarement la question euh, si les gens voudraient voir diminuer le PIB du pays. Mais ce serait l'effet de diminuer euh, l'immigration. Alors, c'est une réalité à laquelle il va falloir faire face si jamais c'est le cas. Pour l'instant, je ne vois pas ce scénario. Il va falloir encore attendre 24 heures pour avoir la réponse euh, claire et nette, parce que c'est encore, je sais que vous avez la difficulté à me croire, mais c'est encore une discussion qui n'est pas totalement finale pour l'instant. Vous avez dit en anglais pour l'immigration francophone, je vais être ambitieux, mais je suis réaliste. Est-ce que vous vous préparez à décevoir les communautés francophones hors Québec en disant ça? Non, pas du tout. Loin de là, je pense qu'on a, eu, on, on, on a eu beaucoup de discussions euh, corsées, moins corsées, avec plusieurs intervenants. Euh, ils savent que le, fédé, le gouvernement fédéral de peine à misère a, a réalisé leur, leur fameux 4,4 C'était du jamais vu, puis c'était un... C'était un, un accroissement de 4, 40, 450 de ce qu'on avait fait par le passé. Euh, mais on l'a fait en pigeant dans notre inventaire, euh, sans mettre nécessairement de logistique en place pour s'assurer qu'il y avait une certaine pérennité à ce, ce type de mécanisme. Alors, mon défi, en tant que ministre, je sais que je, 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 les gens vont penser que je me comporte un peu comme sous-ministre pour l'instant, mais c'est de mettre en place une logistique qui peut se tenir à la longue, euh, dans la mesure où je me fixe un objectif ambitieux, Prenons, par exemple, un, 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 un scénario de 6 et quelques miettes, quitte à pouvoir l'atteindre, et ensuite la croître d'année en année, parce que ça va prendre plus que 6 ça va prendre du 7, du 8, et, et j'en passe. Mais pour l'instant, on n'a aucune mécanique pour le faire. On l'a fait un peu à l'emporte-pièce. Je ne veux pas critiquer quoi que ce soit, mais on l'a fait. Donc, c'est un, un bon résultat. Mais au final, euh, comme je l'ai dit, je ne sais pas si je l'ai dit en anglais ou en français, mais le pire, c'est d'avoir un politicien qui fait des annonces euh, avec des, 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 des objectifs très ambitieux, puis l année, l année, l année, durant l'année, on ne fait absolument rien, puis on ne rencontre pas notre objectif. La, ce, serait, ce serait décevoir d'abord et avant tout les communautés qui, sont, qui demandent euh, une immigration. Est-ce que l'immigration, c'est la solution à tout pour les communautés francophones hors Québec? Euh, la réponse, c'est non, mais c'est un facteur énorme. Alors, ce n'est pas une question de décevoir qui que ce soit. Je pense que les gens seraient plus déçus si... Je me fixais un objectif ambitieux. Tout le monde euh, dirait quel bon fin ministre, mais une an après, euh, c'est la déception totale. Alors, euh, ce, que, ce que je veux plus faire, c'est de m'assurer que la, les, les choses soient mises en place, quitte à pouvoir mettre des objectifs encore plus ambitieux. C'est pour un ministre qui est en place depuis trois mois de comprendre toute la mécanique de son département, mais pour l'instant, je ne suis pas confiant. Euh, je pense qu'elle traite à la mécanique, mais c'est quelque, quelque chose qui va, qui va se dessiner durant l'année à suivre. Next question. Prochaine question. Uh, Ryan Templeton, National Post, sir. You mentioned in your opening remarks there that you're talking about making changes to better align the immigration system with our employment needs, you know, in construction, um, health care, things like that. Are you proposing here then uh, changes to the point system as it operates? Because I know the previous minister made some changes to that. I'm just wondering if you're proposing to go further than that. Yeah, it, it's. Well, good question. I'm looking at about six or seven options that uh, that we're working with uh, my my department on putting forward with people. It it, it needs to be socialized and, and and worked with different industry players uh, to look at what kind of buy-in they would get. But um, a number of options. One would be increasing the points. I mean, that is sort of the area where we have mo we've we've met hope and demand because uh, giving someone points for 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 the qualifications that they have does not necessarily guarantee they will get the job within the industry that that they want to be in. Uh, that's the challenge of the Federation with jurisdictions that are large, largely responsible um, when it comes to professions and regularizing professions, professions that the Supreme Court has said lies with the provinces and territories. Um, so not just that, because I think it's important. It's important to have the skill set. Uh, 
it's also important to have people and organizations that will train up people that come into this country uh, and get them up to this, the, the level of, uh, of expertise that they need to, in this case, uh, build houses, whether it's industrial or, 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 or residential, two different types of, uh, of demands in that area. Looking at the industry codes that we are actually looking for in a more scientific way, whether it's roofers um, or welders, that is an important consideration that gets into le different levels of granularity, but it goes to the efforts that we're trying to make to really align the skill set with the needs that are there. There's a huge aging out in the construction industry that people are really scared about, and I think that is uh, a looming a looming challenge. Um, if, we, if we just don't have the people, we will not be able to build the houses that, that people want to build. Um, there's also options that we're looking for because we don't want to continue to be too addicted on temporary foreign work to make sure there is a pathway to permanent residence for those people that come here and help build the country. Um, and whether that goes through uh, a, a mechanic of using, being able to leverage people that are in this country that have fallen out of status or have an irregular status in this country, that's also an, a couple of options that I'm sort of freewheeling in front of you with a ton of cameras on me, but it is an internal policy process that we want to look uh, and work with unions, uh, labor industry, to make sure that we're actually responding in a nimble way to their needs. And, and I would put in this the, the role of the provinces too that have been working to, to, to work on that foreign credential recognition, which is a huge part of this puzzle that remains um, only partially solved. Thanks. And then you mentioned um, aligning international student uh, numbers better with, I think you said demand. Um, what does that look like? And is that demand from the institutions? Because we've seen they've increased it threefold over the last decade, so they certainly see the demand. Or is that demand from industry in terms of having those international students work in Canada? Yeah, I mean, look, there is a lot of conversations with different competing policy priorities. You have uh, industries in low-skilled labor, um, whether it's big box shops or others, looking for uh, cheap labor and, and wanting to make sure that they maintain a 40-hour work week for some of the students. That's the competing policy with the labor gap that, we've, that, that, we've, that we face in this country, and we need those people working, and why not if they're paying a whole heck of a lot of money to, 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 to come to Canada to study more than a domestic student? Uh, why would we deny them that right? So. Uh, some competing issues there that we need to really tackle with, knowing that the notion of having international students is not necessarily and does not guarantee a pathway to permanent residency and citizenship, but in a context of, um, of, of, of labor demands that are really leaning heavily on these people and sometimes in really skilled areas like, like healthcare, construction. Some of the people I saw at Sheridan College this weekend uh, are people that will want their postgraduate work permits more better aligned to the needs of industry. The postgraduate work permit program is not something that's been re reviewed really in a decade. Um, it's why I was cautious in my, my announcement because the work is ongoing, but making sure we're aligning uh, the ability of someone to live and study in this country um, to the needs of the, sec of, 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 of the employment industry in Canada is, is something that needs some reform and, 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 a, and a closer look at obviously juggling sometimes competing policy needs. Um, that's over and above the discussions on the integrity of the system and fraud that we are tackling first and foremost, and then the role of the provinces to, to, to kind of sh um, fix the, a problem that has been nothing but growing in the last few years. Uh, Minister Miller, Teresa Re Global News. You've said that Canada is not planning on dropping immigration levels, but you know, given the housing crunch, given pressures on the healthcare system, how confident are you that Canada will be able to absorb a, a record number of newcomers at this pace? Yeah, and, and again, it's something that we need to be very, very careful and mindful of, particularly in the, in the, in the public discourse that we entertain. We often look on the supply side, not the demand side of what is, is achieved here. I think speaking in of these immigration levels in, in economic terms is crucial to its acceptability by Canadians. Um, you know, the healthcare industry, uh, nurses, uh, dentists, pharmacists have a huge proportion of immigrants or, or newly arrived Canadians associated with them. And if we are going to, in the context of an aging, po aging population, be able to give Canadians the services that they're entitled to and have expected Canada to and are the signature uh, of who we are as Canadians, a free and open healthcare system, uh, we need immigration. Um, not looking on immigrants as a drain on the system is, 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 is a key sort of more than real, but it's also psychological, um, really important for, for, for continuing to create social consensus around, around immigration. So too in the construction field. I think by proportion, um, 
as I understand it, immigration are, is, is, is fewer immigrants are actually in the construction area and trades uh, for a number of reasons, including some overregulation, but um, not matching what I'd mentioned before, supply and demand properly. And it's why we're looking at a number of policies to do that better, because we know with that industry, which will go through a critical moment as people age out, um, we just need those those folks. People can be trained domestically, but also trained up. And we're seeing that in international student situations where people are in the trades. Um, but it's something that 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 uh, we'll have to continue to monitor because people are, have a tendency to look at the pure, you know, 500,000, for example, as volume of people that suddenly overnight came into Canada. 35 percent of the people are already here. Uh, it's just largely misunderstood. And a good chunk of that, an even larger chunk of that, are people that will uh, actually help build those houses and create the capital, invest the capital into uh, in, in, into continuing to build our country. Um, on the social consensus part of it, we know that there's broad public support for immigration in Canada, but how worried are you that that support may wane if you don't get this right and people don't have a place to live mm -hmm. when they get here? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the throughout the last couple months in particular, uh, the real issue is getting our acts together. And, and I think that's f foremost for the people that come here. Um, I think people, in, unless, look, people flying, f fleeing, fleeing war and famine is a very, very small war, uh, or, but the effects of climate change, sub-Saharan Africa, others find their way to Canada. Um, they're fleeing some very difficult situations, hard for me to judge them. Uh, the vast majority of the others don't necessarily expect for the government of Canada to provide them a house on arrival. It's a very important working premise. Uh, at the same time, I, 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 this is again an issue of failure of planning in, in terms of the, the housing crunch, something that's been, uh, that's been in the mix for, for three to four decades. As a result of the failures of, of, of previous uh, conservative and liberal governments, federally to address this issue and, 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 and provinces as well. Provinces have a huge role in this and um, as we talked this is the sort of the, the 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 subtle genius of the housing accelerator is you're not lecturing cities and towns you're actually creating incentives for for people to buy in so you're not automatically getting into a fight with the jurisdiction you're actually creating the incentives to for people to start building and start, for people to start densify if you look at other similarly situated countries we are rel well just look at the size but even within cities we are relatively not dense this is something that we can work on and it's something that that uh, my colleague and my predecessor Sean Fraser has been has been focused on again we can't do it alone um, which is why we need everyone on board on this. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Melleux, Pascal Vachon pour TFO. Je me demandais, est-ce que vous sentez une pression à plafonner ou à maintenir euh, les niveaux en immigration euh, après vos discussions avec les provinces, avec les, les gens dans le milieu? Est-ce que vous sentez une pression? Moi, honnêtement, ça dépend. Je pense que si, toutes les provinces, territoires ont leurs propres demandes, leurs propres demandes à l'intérieur des, des rubriques. Euh, que ça soit plus d'autonomie, que ça soit plus euh, de, de gens dans telle, telle ou telle industrie. Je n'ai pas fait l'exercice, mais j'ose croire que si je mettais toutes les demandes ensemble, on serait bien au-delà du, du 400, 500 000 euh, de gens qui se trouvent généralement dans, dans, dans les visées de, de nos plans. Um, C'est important pour le gouvernement fédéral d'avoir un rôle euh, d'organisation. C'est notre juridiction. Euh, mais aussi de pouvoir cibler et guider la conversation sur l'accessibilité sociale des immigrants, euh, l'importance d'arrimer l'offre et, 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 la, et la demande. Euh, mais c'est clair qu'on voit, on voit, des, on voit des pressions dans, dans, dans toute situation où il, y a, euh, où il y a des crises ou des défis, surtout dans la crise au, au logement, puis il y a cette tendance de regarder le volume, puis malheureusement de l'associer au... Euh, à la, à la réponse facile ou à une solution facile, c'est-à-dire l'immigration. Le défi, c'est de, de décortiquer tous les différents canaux, les façons dont les gens viennent pour contribuer à notre pays, et de se dire, bon, ben voilà, ce sont des gens qui contribuent de façon nette à l'accroissement du PIB, euh, à, à, à souvrir les demandes dans les, pour la, dans, la, dans, les, dans les pénuries nuancées de main dœuvre à travers le pays. Euh, si je sens la pression, il y a toujours une pression dans ce que je fais. Euh, mais c'est clair que cette discussion est, est, est plus à l'avant-plan qu'elle l'était il y a deux ans, je ne vais pas le nier. En sous question sur l'immigration francophone, euh, il y a plusieurs organismes francophones qui vous demandent une cible de 10-12 
Est-ce que vous ne vous sentez pas, si vous parlez de 6 notamment, vous ne sentez pas que vous contribueriez au deadline du français au Canada ou au deadline du poids démographique des francophones si vous allez en bas de 12 Bien, tant et aussi longtemps qu'on ne l'aura pas rétabli, euh, je ne vais pas être satisfait du résultat. Pour moi, comme je l'ai dit à votre collègue, c'est d'avoir quelque chose qui est réaliste ré et réalisable. Euh, puis je ne veux, veux pas tomber dans le cynisme et faire une annonce euh, qui, qui ne serait pas réalisable sans avoir les, les mécanismes en place pour, de pouvoir de pouvoir répondre aux défis, un défi très important. Alors, c'est la raison pour laquelle vous allez voir les niveaux qui sont fixés euh, dans, dans, dans les quelques jours à suivre. Euh, mais moi, mon défi au courant de la prochaine année, c'est vraiment travailler avec mon département pour s'assurer qu'on a les mécanismes en place pour favoriser non seulement euh, l'augmentation du volume, c'est-à-dire l'augmentation du numérateur, mais aussi euh, de l'intégration qui n'est pas un, un qui, 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 qui est un défi de taille. Hein. Vous n'allez pas demander à, à un couple euh, parfait francophone du Vietnam ou du Cameroun ou, ou de la Belgique de, du jour au lendemain d'être le porte-étendard euh, du fait français hors du Québec. Ce, ce, ce serait présomptueux. Mais je suis sûr qu'ils le feront s'ils se trouvent accompagnés puis dans une communauté où ils se sentent bien, ils ont accès à l'école euh, et des ressources. Alors ça, c'est un défi d'intégration qui nous incombe, mais qui, qui relève aussi des provinces. Um, Marie Wolf from the Globe and Mail. Right. You said that housing affordability would be a key factor when you're talking about uh, working out the levels of immigration. Um, but clearly, uh, they differ across Canada. I mean, the price of a flat in Saskatoon is very different from one in Toronto. Are you envisaging, uh, um, you know, linking immigration to location, uh, more, or, or are you talking about broader uh, restrictions based on how to housing affordability? If you could just expand on that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, and I don't, I, I don't think the thinking is, is uh, you, you know, I, don't, I don't think simply we have the tools to be able to implement, uh, or nor would it be necessarily be des desirable, um, particularly when you're only looking at one side of the equation, when you just look at the raw supply and say this is a supply of people coming to Canada, they themselves have capital, they're driving up the prices. That isn't the reason why interest rates have been hiked over the last few years. Um, and it isn't the reason we are seeing certain spikes in, 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 certain, um, in certain regions of Canada. Uh, again, what we are clearly trying to compose with is a, skills, a skill shortage, knowing that that skill shortage uh, has not necessarily been properly uh, rectified or addressed by the federal government or provincial governments for that matter. Um, I know my own home, prom home province, we went into the pandemic with, uh, with a labor shortage and we <laughs> came out with a labor shortage and we haven't properly addressed it, um, particularly given the particularities of the relationship we have with Quebec. I, I would say also, uh, when we talk about affordability, we also have to, and, and planning, we also have to have the ability, particularly in rural regions, uh, to accommodate people that are coming there to fill important gaps, whether it's you know, maintaining a hospital that was on the verge of closing or a school, those people need somewhere to stay. So that challenge is not insignificant and it will vary from region to region. I think the strategic plan and, and even if we had the best plan, plenty of governments would not necessarily follow it. But it is something that is important as a guide for us to look at where the challenges are and to make sure we're reflecting on it. So um, I don't want to confuse correlation with causation and I don't want to pretend that this is a linear This is a linear discussion, but it's certainly something we need to be sensitive to, particularly given the volumes that have, um, that, are, that have generated, at least in the aggregate, these discussions that we're seeing that are more, um, more in the public eye in the last year or so. Um, on a different topic, I wonder if you could comment on uh, your thoughts about the plight of Palestinians. I know there are many trapped in Gaza with family here who are desperate to get them here. I know it's difficult, obviously it's closed off at the moment, but there has been talk in Parliament about uh, whether Canada should create a scheme as, as we did for the Ukrainians, and I wondered if that's something that is on the horizon or so it's being discussed. And equally in Lebanon, I gather there are people who uh, have family here and uh, of course the Canadian government has said advise them to leave, but there are long queues to get visas if uh, you know the, the accounts of some families can be uh, Uh, credited. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I, I have a lot. Uh, I, I think that what's going on in, in Gaza is, is a humanitarian calamity. Um, our focus primarily as a government is getting out Canadians 
and their families from Gaza. There's um, a shade over 400 there that, that are trapped. That needs to be and remain our primary focus. Um, we are planning for all eventualities and planning foremost to make sure that there isn't an escalation of the conflict, but we are planning particularly even the volumes of Canadians and family members that live in Lebanon to make sure that uh, were something to arise that we are properly prepared um, to respond quickly. Uh, obviously, there has been no triggering event as of yet, but it's something that we are working on uh, really hard. As to the theoretical, uh, I don't want to entertain the theoretical of what happens if um, we are trying to prevent the if, and I think that is, that is and will remain the focus for now, but obviously very conscious of uh, what's been um, what's been spoken about and in terms of potential resettlement but again um, I can't comment on it publicly at this time hi minister yesterday your department sent emails to the would-be Afghan migrants who still have applications pending and are waiting in Pakistan the note told them to not leave their guest houses because of concerns Pakistan would arrest or deport them. It also told them to actually email your department if they do get arrested and also noted that your department can't help them regularize their stay in Pakistan even if their application process to Canada is completed. Do you expect uh, a migrant in a jail cell to be able to email your department and what hope is there for these folks at this point given you've reached your goal of 40,000? So I do not presume that a migrant in a jail cell will um, receive any form of communication. Uh, I am very concerned about particularly our, particularly our clients that we've made commitments to in Afghanistan, um, often living in, 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 in really, really difficult conditions with fear hanging over their head. I briefly had the chance to speak to the interim um, government's Pakistani, Pakistan's Minister of the Interior uh, very briefly on Sunday to express my concerns about uh, the potential removal of Afghans into, into Afghanistan and my concern at that level. Uh, obviously, in order for this to work and to get people to safety in Canada, uh, it takes a working relationship. So uh, it was a productive conversation. Um, I am also very conscious of my role to be very careful in not lecturing people about their interior and domestic politics. Um, and it's something that, that for the sake of those that we are trying to serve and get out of Afghanistan, I'll be very judicious publicly in speaking about Rafi. Uh, that said, it was, it was a very productive conversation and it's work that will be ongoing. I have said, it, I have said uh, time and time again that the 40,000 number is not uh, a ceiling in and of itself. Uh, because we do have to look at what our commitment was to, to Afghans and those who served us when we made it a couple of years ago and to make sure we fulfill that to the best of our ability, knowing that we are working in a very difficult operational environment, difficult in Pakistan, um, difficult in other partner countries, but even most difficult inside Afghanistan. Thanks. And just on another note, um, Israel's Ministry of Intelligence presented their government with a concept paper that suggested Palestinians could be moved out of Gaza and that um, Canada itself uh, could accept them as refugees. What do you say to that idea? Uh, hard to speculate on it. Um, we are uh, open to those f fleeing war. This is a war. Uh, at the same time, it's something that it's very difficult for me to speculate publicly on. I haven't read the report. would have to read it. Uh, but again, the focus, as I mentioned to your colleague, is to get a humanitarian corridor open to welcome Canadians and their families out of Gaza. It is still very much a pressing concern and one that um, remains unfulfilled yet. Bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre. Antoine Trépanier du journal Le Droit. Le Conference Board puis euh, l'Institut sur la citoyenneté a annoncé ce matin les chiffres concernant les immigrants qui partaient du Canada une, après être arrivés au pays. Euh, depuis les années 80, ces chiffres-là montent constamment. En 2019, on parle de 67 000 immigrants qui ont décidé de partir. Comment vous réagissez à ces chiffres-là, à ce rapport-là? Puis comment votre plan d'aujourd'hui peut répondre à ça, finalement? Bien, sans savoir les raisons particulières pour lesquelles les gens choisissent de quitter le pays, euh, difficile de vous donner des, des, des réponses 
concrète, c'est clair que si on peut en découler un, une thématique, oui, peut-être le, le, le coût d'y vivre, de vivre au Canada, euh, est, est, est difficile, difficile, difficulté d'intégration. Les gens aussi, quand c'est des, quand des, gens, des, des, des migrants de type dit économique, ils ont leur choix de pays aussi. Hein, donc, euh, d'une certaine façon, on veut ces gens-là, on veut qu'ils s'intègrent parce qu'ils appa apportent du capital au pays. Ce ne sont pas nécessairement des gens qui sont désespérés. Il y a un certain désespoir qui pousse les gens à venir euh, au Canada. Je ne leur enlève rien. Mais la large majorité des gens qui viennent ici, c'est des gens qui viennent pour des raisons économiques. Donc, c'est-à-dire, c'est des gens qui ont du capital, qui ont du choix. Euh, avec les chiffres qui augmentent, il faudrait garder le, le, le pourcentage pour voir s'il y a vraiment une tendance. Ce que moi, je vois de mon bord, c'est des demandes de, sans précédent de venir au Canada euh, dans les 5 millions de, 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 de dossiers qui, qui ont été traités euh, ici, cette année, c'est un volume absolument record. Alors, euh, pour que je puisse en parler en détail, il va falloir que, que je regarde ça. Mais on, on, on suit ça, là, parce que ce qu'on ne veut pas, c'est des inefficacités qui font en sorte que les gens choisissent un autre pays. On vient tout juste de lancer des initiatives qui sont tissées sur mesure pour des gens qui ont de l'expertise. On parle du H1B. Euh, les résultats sont à venir euh, pour voir si ça a été un succès. Euh, mais ça a été, euh, c'est des gens qui sont, qui sont très intelligents, qui vont, qui vont vraiment améliorer, euh, qui vont am vraiment améliorer le Canada dans leurs compétences qu'ils apportent au Canada, qui ne sont pas nécessairement ici. Alors, c'est quelque chose qu'on doit regarder de près. Vous avez dit, vous avez dit ce matin euh, qu'il faut améliorer quand même l'expérience euh, des nouveaux arrivants, des immigrants. Euh, quelles mesures phares, pour vous, pourraient répondre le, de façon la plus adéquate possible pour justement améliorer leurs conditions et améliorer euh, leur expérience ici comme euh, nouveaux arrivants? Dans, dans notre champ de compétences, je dirais, euh, je dirais les, euh, les délais de traitement. Ça a, vraiment, ça a été exécrable. Euh, il, y a des raisons, euh, il y a des raisons pour ça. Modernisation du système, euh, la COVID notamment, euh, l'incapacité de faire des choses à la main, les gens qui travaillaient chez eux, c'est clair qu'ils ne peuvent pas venir au travail, puis les, les, les dossiers s'empilaient. Euh, C'était toute une saga qu'on a vécue il y a un an, quand j'ai été président du, service, du comité du cabinet des services. Alors, je n'étais pas ministre de l'immigration dans ce temps-là, mais je savais ce à quoi, de, de quoi ça avait l'air. Euh, c'est clair qu'on peut faire mieux. Puis je pense que le rapport de la vérificatrice générale en témoigne le progrès. Euh, mais ma conclusion, c'est de mieux faire notre job au fédéral. L'autre élément, c'est de mieux coordonner avec les provinces. C'est clair qu'il y a des éléments qu'on ne peut pas remplir à nous seuls. Crise du logement, euh, les besoins en santé, d'arrimer vraiment l'offre et la demande. Puis ça, c'est un travail de plus longue haleine, euh, mais c'est des choses qui font, euh, qui font de pair. Oui, bonjour, Sandrine Viera du Devoir. Euh, Monsieur Miller, pouvez-vous nous confirmer si le Québec va embarquer dans l'initiative de l'accueil des 15 000 migrants de la Colombie, Haïti et du Venezuela? Pour l'instant, la réponse, c'est non. Euh, c'est une réponse qui me désole, euh, surtout étant donné que c'est avec un, un partenaire stratégique, stratégique c'est-à-dire les, les États-Unis, qui veulent une, en sorte une soupape de, de sûreté, de sécurité pour euh, des gens qui fuient l'Amérique, certains pays de, de l'Amérique du Sud. On, on ne fait pas face aux mêmes défis que les, les Américains à notre frontière sud que ce que les Américains font face euh, avec leur frontière au Mexique. Donc, euh, pour les Américains, ils nous demandent de faire notre travail. Puis si le Québec, qui forme 25 de la population, n'est pas n'est pas la mesure de le faire. C'est malheureux. Euh, je pense que c'est une conversation qu'on pourra continuer, surtout dans la mesure où on a un volet dédié de migration haïtien, la forte prépondérance de la population haïtienne étant à Montréal. Je pense, puis francophone de plus, impeccable. Donc, ça va de soi que ces gens-là devraient être accueillis par le Québec. Ça remplirait plusieurs objectifs. On pourrait trouver des enseignants, etc. Euh, donc, pour moi, c'est logique. Mais côté, côté humanitaire, pour l'instant, je trouve ça un peu désolant. Sur une autre note, euh, comptez-vous imposer un quota d'étudiants étrangers, y compris pour le Québec? Pour l'instant, pas pour l'instant. Ben, écoutez, le Québec euh, m'a dit qu'il revendiquait la juridiction sur les étudiants internationaux. Du même coup de plume, rejetait la juridiction sur les demandeurs d'asile. La différence étant qu'un à 50 000 l'autre, zéro. 
ça me frustre, euh, mais c'est clair qu'il y a une juridiction partagée. Et donc, ils ont leur mot à dire. Ce n'est pas moi, nécessairement, d'être euh, la police du sous-financement secondaire, post-secondaire, qui, euh, qui était la règle au pays depuis plusieurs années, partout au Canada. Euh, mon rôle, c'est d'enrayer la fraude, un rôle très clairement de façon juridictionnelle qui relève ben, de, de tous les paliers, des deux paliers, et de s'assurer que les menaces à l'intégrité du système euh, soient enrayées dans ma capacité, euh, somme toute limitée, de le faire, mais je suis prêt à le faire, puis je suis prêt à faire davantage si les provinces n'en font pas plus. Le Québec, par contre, a fait un travail euh, durant ces dernières années, de, durant les dernières années de, 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 de un peu faire le ménage dans leur système d'institutions approuvées pour les visas, donc ils ont une longueur d'avance. Euh, mais c'est clair, niveau Quota, spécifiquement, c est, c est, c est, je pense, pour moi, ce n'est pas la mesure à retenir pour l'instant. Je me réserve le droit, évidemment. Je pense que ce qu'on a annoncé vendredi, c'était quelque chose de, de rationnel, de sensé. Euh, mais si ça perdure pendant l'année à suivre, il va falloir prendre des mesures plus fortes. J'espère ne pas le faire de façon unilatérale. Okay, Kevin Gallagher, CTV National News. Thanks for taking our questions, Minister. I'm just going to follow up on one that was already asked in French around the uh, rising number in immigrants who are onward migration, leaving Canada. What is your department looking at in terms of what are the causes of the difficulty in retaining newcomers to Canada, and what are the solutions that you're looking at? Yeah, and without reading, having read the report, Kevin, and, and I will because it's important to kind of gauge where this is going, looking at whether this is a true trend, um, and then looking at what we can actually do to retain people. The, a lot, I would say the vast majority of people that come to Canada have a choice. Um, and if that choice is more competitive elsewhere, I think there's a competitive advantage that we're losing. Uh, so that's something that I'm going to have to need, that we will need to focus on as a department and as a government. Uh, the H-1B scoop, I guess, that we did is something that was, uh, got a lot of public fanfare, but the results are still uh, pending, but I think those are really talented people that could contribute to any country. Uh, the skills and labor streams that are in fact the envy of a lot of countries that other countries are starting to, to, to reproduce and properly matching supply and demand by implication mean that you're getting a brighter, uh, more qualified type of person. And those people do have choices. So the reasons for which they would choose to leave, and again, I'm speculating, um, could be affordability, it could be, uh, you know, non-recognition of diplomas, uh, a, a unitary state perhaps being more capable of imposing um, accreditation as opposed to Canada, where the Supreme Court's told me that, that I have no job in, 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 um, in, in, in eliminating accreditation standards. These are really things that are up to the provinces. Uh, there are plenty of reasons that I could speculate, but it's, it's, it's sand in the gears that would make someone frustrated with being here and then leaving. What I'm also seeing, and this is the countervailing position, is, uh, is, is um, historic volume in people that want to come to Canada. And attracting that right volume, I think, is the challenge of, uh, of our government. Uh, but with that volume comes the corresponding pressure sometimes for people to say, well, hey, this wasn't for me. Uh, but right now, I think the, the main trend, if there were to, if you were to tease something accurate out of this, is that we have unprecedented demand to come to Canada. Don't fault people for that, but we just want to make sure that we're doing it in the, in the way Canadians expect us to do it. So I'll be looking at the report um, and seeing if there are trends that are concerning. You've been asked a few times about housing affordability. And obviously, you're well aware of the recent surveys that are Canadians are saying that they have, you know, concern about the level of immigration and the level of immigrants coming into Canada because of uh, lack of available housing, housing shortages, housing availability and affordability in general. But to today, in many of your answers, I hear that you're saying, well, the housing issue was long before we started increasing our immigration levels. But still, there is this feeling that people are saying to survey uh, companies that they're concerned and they're, uh, this is a rise in people saying that they're uncomfortable with the levels of immigration. So tomorrow you're announcing a number. Um, you're on the record saying that it's not going to be lower, maybe higher around, around the same. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But what reassurance can you give to people who seem to be having an increased anxiety about this, that you know, the number of immigrants is not the source of the problem they see when it comes to finding a home and affordability? You know, in, in politics, again, it's very hard, or, or even in personal relationships, it's very hard to argue with feelings. Um, I, know th I know the feelings that, uh, that I felt when I first got into politics when uh, there were affordability challenges um, around housing, but for a lower segment, you know, a population that was um, 
on the lower income side of the of uh, of the population and 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 the fight that we took as a federal government to be the first government in a generation to invest in housing uh, certainly not enough as evidence is proof of today uh, but the interest on debt when I was in in 2015 was uh, was pretty much zero and continued to be so uh, it isn't immigration or immigrants that raise the interest rates uh, and this is something that has to do with poor planning over the last 30 to 40 years some provinces having done better um, than others but clearly a crunch that is being felt as a generalized fashion so that person renewing their mortgage they're feeling a crunch that perhaps has nothing to do with the house that an international students looking for or uh, or someone that, or that has just gotten to this country uh, sometimes even though it's the same concept we may be mixing apples and oranges again uh, i'm trying to rationalize a debate of feelings and and clearly it's something we need to be sensitive to and clearly it's something we know that on uh, on the immigration side in terms of the labor and the labor gaps and the needs that we need to fulfill those labor gaps uh, identifying clearly identifying for Canadians where that gap is going to get filled in the context of an aging population so uh, yes it's a, a challenge sometimes publicly to convince people that immigration is the solution um, again we never ask in, 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 in our um, in our polling whether people would want a reduction of the gross domestic product were they to reduce immigration which would be the net result of things but again doing it in a way that's uncoordinated leads into that certain that feeling of uncertainty and the feeling that Canadians are being hard done by I wasn't trying to sound cavalier to say this is something that's been happening for 30 years because it is urgent and it's in urgent that we address it I think you've seen my colleague Sean Fraser uh, out you know, leveraging a lot of the announcements that we've had on on the housing accelerator and, and and highlighting a lot of the builds that the federal government's been responsible for again this is the net uh, conclusion that I've of all my meetings with people over the last few months particularly in this ministry is to do this in a coordinated way and in a way where we're not um, looking like we're out of step with with provinces that are putting effort into it we will now take uh, one question over the phone Eden. Thank you, Merci. As a reminder for participants on the phone, you can press star 1 if you have a question. Vous pouvez appuyer sur étoile 1 si vous avez une question pour les médias au téléphone. Nous avons une question de Edith Bergeron, la presse canadienne. La parole est à vous. Ah oui, ok, je présume que c'est moi. Je m'appelle Emily Bergeron. Donc, je m'entends en écho. Je ne sais pas si vous arrêtez ça. Donc, juste, M. Miller, sur les. les les, euh, la volonté d'intégrer le, les enjeux de logement, euh, d'accès aux soins de santé, euh, la planification des infrastructures, dans, au moment là, de, de faire la planification des, des, des niveaux d'immigration. Euh, bien sûr, vous voulez le faire en collaboration avec les provinces, c'est écrit noir sur blanc, euh, mais euh, comment vous allez vous prendre une responsabilité fédérale à, à ce niveau-là Étant donné que, par exemple, euh, la santé, c'est une juridiction provinciale, même si l'immigration, c'est euh, de compétences partagées, comment vous, euh, vous allez, euh, euh, disons, jongler avec tout ça? Et est-ce que ça sera au niveau d'indicateurs précis? Euh, quelle forme là, ça peut prendre? Oui, Émilie, puis la, la question est, est fort pertinente et importante. C est, c est, le mot d'ordre, c'est la. C est, c est, c'est vraiment ce mot de coordination. C'est clair qu'ayant identifié les grands enjeux et les grands indicateurs macroéconomiques, que très vite, il va falloir parler spécifiquement de ce dont vous parlez, c'est-à-dire quels sont les emplois qui sont désirables, dans quelle partie de la région, les grandes lignes qu'on a, qu a pu établir ces dernières années sont plutôt conceptuelles que précises, c'est-à-dire on savait qu'il y avait une pénurie de main dœuvre il y a des qualifications euh, auxquelles on donne des, des points, les gens arrivent ici, puis ils se débrouillent. Alors, ce que les Canadiens nous demandent de plus en plus, euh, surtout dans le contexte actuel, c'est de nous, le gouvernement fédéral, de se débrouiller, et puis de travailler avec les provinces. Vous savez, la, 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 les compétences, les juridictions, puis ce, cette bataille de ping-pong est largement méconnue par les Canadiens, donc, mais ils en sont les premiers victimes. Euh, c'est clair que dans les compétences, on peut jouer un rôle accru de coordination, montrer aux autres provinces qu'il y en a qui font leur travail. Euh, ce 
qui nous rallie dans tout ça, c'est que le besoin se fait sentir tant au fédéral qu'au qu provincial. Et dans certaines circonstances, euh, ce sont les provinces qui viennent nous voir pour, pour dire comment est-ce qu'on peut quoi, fait, accru, avoir un effort supplémentaire de, de, de coordination. Donc, un, ce ne sera pas facile. De deux, il euh, n'y a personne qui s'attendait à ce que ça soit facile. Et, et, et trois, la preuve va être, va être dans les mesures qu'on va prendre pour mieux arrimer l'offre et la demande suite aux discussions qu'on a avec les provinces dans leur champ de compétences et dans leur juridiction dans la, dans, dans la prochaine année, pour savoir euh, si en, français, il y a du, en bon français il y a du buy-in ou, ou non. Euh, mais c'est clair que dans toutes mes interactions, d'être plus, plus mesuré, ciblé, coordonné, c'est euh, le mot d'ordre. En suivi, vous avez dit tout à l'heure que euh, pour ce qui est de l'annonce de demain euh, sur les cibles, vous avez dit que ce n'est pas une décision tout à fait finale, et pas totalement finale, même si vous, vous avez dit à ma collègue euh, qu'elle a peut-être de la misère à croire ça. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu que ça veut dire, le fait que ce n'est pas tout à fait final? Est-ce que bon, il y avait une rencontre du Conseil des ministres ce matin? Est-ce qu'il y, y a certains désaccords? Vous avez parlé que c'était un débat de société. Euh, donc, j'imagine que peut-être un débat de société, ça se reflète au sein du Conseil des ministres. Qu'est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire sur euh, les, les différents points de vue, euh, sans entrer dans, dans trop de détails, évidemment, mais est-ce qu'il euh, y a une certaine division au, au sein du Conseil des ministres euh, sur ces enjeux-là? J'allais dire à la blague que vous demanderez à Louis Blouin pour savoir si y si a les réponses. Euh, mais euh, la réalité, c'est ce, la raison pour laquelle on en parle en, en temps de détail ces jours-ci, plutôt que le niveau de détail qu'on en a parlé ces dernières années, c'est qu'il y a plus d'attention à l'enjeu. Euh, il, il, il y a un examen plus minutieux des chiffres euh, et des piliers qui sous-tendent ces chiffres et les niveaux qu'on veut établir, plus d'attention à l'interne qu'on veut porter pour s'assurer qu'il n'y a pas d'effet pervers et qu'on puisse bien expliquer à la population canadienne euh, pourquoi on fait ces, ces, ces niveaux ainsi que pourquoi on, 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 et comment on les justifie. Donc, je dirais que c'est pas… Euh, euh, je sais, ayant parlé à mes prédécesseurs, que il y a des décisions qui ont été prises à la toute dernière minute. Euh, cette fois-ci, ce n'est pas nécessairement l'exception, mais je dirais que les gens qui, euh, en circonstances normales, n'auraient pas eu de commentaires à cet effet-là, euh, en portent plus attention et de façon plus minutieuse. J'essaie je, d'être pas euh, euh, J'essaie d'être très précis dans, dans ma réponse sans vous dire qui. Thank you, Minister. This now concludes this press conference. Merci beaucoup. Ceci conclut la conférence de presse.